Hello everyone. It is said that reading a storybook plays very important role in learning a language. I'm your English teacher and my name is Muhammadullah. So today we're gonna start with a beautiful story of your textbook that is the best Christmas present in the world. In this video, I'm gonna give you a brief summary about the story first and then we'll start reading. Are you ready for that? So let's get started. Here we go. The first chapter, the best Christmas present in the world. There are some dates and or periods of time in the history of the world that are so significant that everyone knows and remembers them. The story you will read mentions one such date and event. A war between the British and the Germans in 1914. Can you guess which war it was? Before we start the reading portion, let me give you a brief summary about the story. Okay? The story begins with the author buying a cheap roll top table from a junk shop. It was in a bad condition, but the author thought that he would restore it. On Christmas Eve, he started to repair it. The table was of the 19th century and was made of oak. The drawers were badly damaged due to the water and fire. When the author pulled out the last drawer, he found a secret space there. In that secret space was a small tin box. On top of that box, it was written, Jim's last letter, received January 25, 1915. Inside the tin box was an envelope with the address written on it, Mrs. Jim McPherson, 12 Copper Beaches, Bridport. The date on the envelope was December 26, 1914. The author now begins to read the letter. It was written by Jim McPherson to his wife Connie. He had narrated a beautiful incident that took place on the battlefield on Christmas Day. It was Christmas Day and the English and Germans were at war. Both the armies were in their respective trenches. All of a sudden, he saw someone waving a white flag from the German side. He heard German soldiers wishing them Merry Christmas. Some of the English soldiers also wished them the same. Surprisingly, they saw German soldiers moving towards them, which alarmed Captain McPherson. He thought it could be a trick. But the German soldiers brought canned meat and wine. The soldiers were hugging and wishing each other. Hans Wolf, the German officer, shook hands with McPherson. Hans, Hans Wolf told him that he was from Dusseldorf and played cello in an orchestra. McPherson told him that he was from Dorset and was a school teacher. Hans Wolf told him that he knew English and Thomas Hardy is his favorite writer. In his book, Far From the Madding Crowd, he has described Dorset. Thus he knew a lot about Dorset from there. McPherson offered him the cake sent by his wife Connie. 
The soldiers played football together. After the match, all of them enjoyed the food and drinks. And later, they parted back to their trenches unwillingly. Later at night, both the armies sang carols for a while, and then there was silence. He wrote that these memories are a treasure for his lifetime and hoped that the war will end soon. After reading the letter, the author decides to return the letter to Mrs. Macpherson. He goes to her house in Bridport, Dorset, and finds that it is burnt. Mrs. Macpherson, 101 years old, was inside the house at the time of the fire. The author comes to know that Mrs. Macpherson is in the nursing home. So when he reaches there, he finds her sitting on a chair. He returns the letter to her and her eyes lit up. She takes his hand with eyes filled with tears and says that her gym kept the promise. They talk each other lovingly for a long. Mrs. Macpherson says that it is the best Christmas present in the world. So this was the best Christmas present for Mrs. Macpherson. That's why the title of the chapter is The Best Christmas Present in the World. Let's begin now the reading. Let me start from here. I spotted in a junk shop in Bridport a roll-top desk. The man said it was early 19th century and oak. I had wanted one, but they were far too expensive. This one was in a bad condition. The roll top in several pieces, one leg clumsily mended, scotch marks all down one side. It was going for very little money. I thought I could restore it. It would be a risk, a challenge, but I had to have it. I paid the man and brought it back to my workroom at the back of the garage. I began work on it on Christmas Eve. I removed the roll top completely and pulled out the drawers. The veneer had lifted almost everywhere. It looked like water damage to me. Both fire and water had clearly taken their toll on this desk. The last drawer was stuck fast. I tried all I could to ease it out gently. In the end, I used brute force. I stuck it sharply with the side of my fist and drawer flew open to reveal a shallow space underneath a secret drawer. There was something in there. I reached in and took out a small black tin box. Silo taped on the top of it was a piece of lined no note paper and written on it in shaky handwriting. Jim's last letter received January 25, 1915. To be buried with me when the time comes. I knew as I did it that it was wrong of me to open the box but curiosity got the better of my scruples. It usually does. Inside the box, there was an envelope. The address read, Mrs. Jim Macpherson, 12 Copper Breaches, Bridport, Dorset. I took out the letter and unfolded it. It was written in pencil and dated at the top, December 26, 1914. So this is the end of the scene first. C. 
Sin Sikin begins here. Dearest Connie, I write to you in much in a much happier frame of mind because something wonderful has just happened that I must tell you about at once. We were all standing to in our trenches yesterday morning, Christmas morning. It was crisp and quite all about as beautiful as morning as I have ever seen. As beautiful a morning as I have ever seen. As cold and frosty as a Christmas morning should be. I should like to be able to tell you that we began it. But the truth, I'm ashamed to say, is that Fritz began it first. Someone saw a white flag waving from the trenches opposite. Then they were calling out to us from across no man's land, Happy Christmas, Tommy! Happy Christmas! When we had got over the surprise, some of us shouted back, Same to you, Fritz. Same to you. I thought that would be that. We all did, but then suddenly one of them was up there in his grey great coat and waving a white flag. Don't shoot, lads! Someone shouted, and no one did. Then there was another fish up on the parapet and another. Keep your heads down! I told the man it's a trick, but it wasn't. One of the Germans was waving a bottle above his head. It is Christmas Day, Tommy. We have, we have schnapps. We have sausage. We meet you. Yes. By this time, there, was, there were dozens of them walking towards us across no man's land and not a rifle between them. Little Private Morris was the first up. Come on, boys. What are we waiting for? And then there was no stopping them. I was the officer. I should have stopped them there and then, I suppose. But the truth is that it never even occurred to me I should. All along their line and ours, I could see men walking slowly towards one another, gray, gray coats, khaki coats meeting in the middle, and I was one of them. I was part of this. In the middle of the war, we were making peace. You cannot imagine, dearest Connie, my feelings as I looked into the eyes of the Fritz officer who approached me. Hand outstretched, Hans Wolf, he said, gripping my hand warmly and holding it. I am from Dusseldorf. I play the cello in the orchestra. Happy Christmas. Captain Jim McPherson, I replied. And a happy Christmas to you too. I'm a school teacher from Dorset in the west of England. Ah, Dorset, he smiled. I know this place. I know it very well. We shared my rum, rum ration and his excellent sausage. And we, and we talked. And we talked. Connie, how we talked? He spoke almost perfect English. But it turned out that he had never set food in Dorset. But it turned out that he had never set foot in Dorset, never even been to England. He had learned all he knew of England from school and from reading books in English. His favorite writer was Thomas Hardy, his favorite book, Far From the Madding Crowd. So out there in no man's land, we talked of Bathsheba and Gabriel Oak and Sergeant Troy and Dorset. He had a wife and one son, born just six months ago.
As I looked about me, there were hurdles of khaki and gray everywhere, all over no man's land, smoking, laughing, talking, drinking, eating. Hans Wolf and I shared the, what was left of your wonderful Christmas cake. I shared what was left of your wonderful Christmas cake, Connie. He thought the marzipan was the best he had ever tasted. I agreed. We agreed about everything and he was my enemy. There never was a Christmas party like it, Connie. Then someone, I don't know who, brought out a football. Great courts were dumped in pities to make goal posts, and the next thing we knew it was Tommy against Fritz out in the middle of no man's land. Hans Wolf and I looked on and cheered, chapping our hands and stamping our feet to keep out the cold as much as anything. There was a moment when I noticed our breaths mingling in there between us. He saw he saw it too and smiled. Jim McPherson, he said after a while, I think this is how we should resolve this war, a football match. No one dies in a football match. No children are orphaned. No wives, became, no wives, no wives become widows. I prefer cricket, I told him. Then we, Tommies, could be sure of winning, probably. We laughed at that, and together we watched the game. Sad to say, Connie, Fritz won. Two goals to one. But as Hans Wolf generously said, our goal was wider than theirs, so it wasn't quite fair. The time came, and all too soon when the game was finished. The schnapps and the rum and the sausage had long since run out, and we knew it was all over. I wished Hans well and told him I hoped he would see his family again soon, that the fighting would end and we could all go home. I think that is what every soldier wants on both sides. Hans Wolf said, Take care, Jim McPherson. I shall never forget this moment, nor you. He saluted and walked away from me slowly. Unwillingly, I felt. He turned to wave just once and then became one of the hundreds of grey-coated men drifting back towards their trenches. That night back in our dugouts, we heard them singing a carol, and singing it quite beautifully. It was, it was stilly night, silent night. Our boys gave them a rousing chorus of while shepherds watched. We exchanged carols for a while, and then we all fell silent. We had had our time of peace and goodwill, a time I will treasure as long as I live. Dearest Connie, by Christmas time next year, this war will be nothing but a distant and terrible memory. I know from all that happened today how much both armies long for peace. We shall be together again soon, I'm sure of it. Now, this is the end of the scene two. Let's begin now the scene third. I folded the letter again and slipped it carefully back into its envelope. I kept awake all night. By morning, I knew what I had to do. I drove into Bridport, just a few miles away. I asked a boy walking his dog where Copper Beaches was. House number 12 turned out to be nothing but a burned out shell. The roof gapping, the windows boarded up. I knocked at the house next door and asked if anyone knew the 
Whereabouts of a Mrs. Macpherson? Oh yes, said the old man in his slippers. He knew her well. A lovely old lady, he told me, a bit muddle-headed. But at her age, she was entitled to be, wasn't she? A hundred and one years old, she had been in the house when it caught fire. No one really knew how the fire had started, but it could well have been candles. She used candles rather than electricity, because she always thought electricity was too expensive. The fireman had got her out just in time. She was in a nursing home now, he told me. Burlington House, on the Dorchester Road on the other side of town. I found Burlington House nursing home easily enough. There were paper chains up in there were paper chains up in the hallway and a lighted Christmas tree stood in the corner with a lopsided angle on top. I said I was a friend come to visit Mrs. Macpherson to bring her a Christmas present. I could see through into the dining room where everyone was wearing a paper hat and singing. The matron had a hat. Had a ha the matron had a hat on too and seemed happy enough to see me. She even offered me a mind spy. She walked me along the corridor. Mrs. Macpherson is not in with the others. She told me she is rather confused today, so we thought it best if she had a good rest. She has no family, you know. No one visits, so I'm sure she'll be only too pleased to see you. She took me into a cons conservatory with wicker chairs and potted plants all around and left me. The old lady was sitting in a wheelchair, her hands folded in her lap. She had silver white hair pinned into a wispy bun. She was gazing out at the garden. Hello, I said. She turned and looked up at me vacantly. Happy Christmas, Connie. I went on. I found this. I think it's yours. As I was speaking, her eyes never left my face. I opened the tin box and gave it to her. That was the moment her eyes lit up with recognition and her face became suffused with a sudden glow of happiness. I explained about the desk, about how I had found it, but I don't think she was listening. For a while, she said nothing, but stroked the letter tenderly with her fingertips. Suddenly, she reached out and took my hand. Her eyes were filled with tears. You told me you'd come home by Christmas, dearest, she said. And here you are, the best Christmas present in the world. Come closer, Jim dear, sit down. I sat down beside her and she kissed my cheek. I read... I read your letters so often, Jim, every day. I wanted to hear your voice in my head. It always made me feel you were with me. And now you are. Now you are back. You can read it to me yourself. Would you do that for me, Jim dear? I just want to hear your voice again. I'd love that so much. And then perhaps we'll have some tea. I've made you a nice Christmas cake, marzipan all around. I know how much you love marzipan. All right. Okay. So that's all for today's lesson. See you next time with a new video. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.